Pivot. Shifting directions. Same destination. Welcome to Pivot. My name is Ruben Ramos. And I'm Jonathan Pinato. And we'd like to welcome you to opening night of our Pivot series, Shifting Directions, Same Destination. That's right, Jonathan. And we're so excited for what God is going to do through these seven nights, these seven messages that God has for us. Jonathan, can you tell us a little bit of what we're to expect tonight and what to expect throughout the series? First, we'll begin with a musical selection performed by one of our local area churches, followed by a segment on mental health. Then we'll have a, a presentation from one of our guest speakers who's going to be digging deeper into one of these hot topics that we've been going through this year. And we know that as we go through tough times and difficult times, God always has a word for us to redirect our path. That's right. And we want you to be part of that conversation. And so we encourage you right now to text PIVOTFL to 77411. Again, that's PIVOTFL to 77411. And once you send that text message in, then you'll be able to text your questions, your comments, and your prayer requests. You can make this program so much better, not only for us that are on this end of the camera, but for everyone watching. When you engage and are part of the conversation, we get to hear from you and what's going through, through your perspective, through your life right now. One way we thought about, Jonathan, to engage viewers online is by giving them something. What are we giving away tonight? That's right. Well, we have a book written by Pastor Tara Vincross entitled Deep Calling, and we also have two $25 Amazon gift cards that we'll be giving away We'll be giving them away. I'm sorry, I was just texting 77411. Oh, right. <laughs> I can't get none of those. But anyway, we want to give those out to you. So the 10th, 15th, 20th person to text 77 to 77411, Pivot FL will receive either a gift card or a book. That's right. And we want to thank all the viewers watching here at the First Coast, also across our state and throughout our country. We're so blessed not to only do this on our own, Jonathan, but so many churches in the Jacksonville area and throughout the state. But it's not about necessarily just the church. It's about every individual who this year has felt alone or has felt scared or has felt the weight of the year on their shoulders. And so this is for you. And so a way that you can also be part of this is by sharing this with somebody else that you know needs to hear a positive message tonight or throughout the week. So we want to invite you. If right now you're watching on Facebook, we want you to click share on the lower button there on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the transmission coming through. We want you to share it with a friend, with a family member, with someone that needs to hear God's word tonight. That's right. And at this time, we'll have a musical selection from LifePoint Christian Fellowship. What holds your heart, what stirs your soul, what matters come to mind? The cares you keep, the thoughts you think, it's not all wasted time. Seek and you will find Joy still comes in the morning Hope still walks with the hurting If you're still alive and breathing Praise the Lord Don't stop dancing and dreaming There's still good news worth repeating So lift your head and keep singing Praise the by we wonder why we lost our way from home our father finds the child inside we had left for growing old Good news worth repeating 
everything, let everything praise the Lord. In the working, in the waiting, let it praise the Lord. In the blessing, in the breaking, come on, praise. If you're still alive and breathing, praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. There's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. If you're still alive, Joy when my heart is 
that musical selection with us tonight. Uh, we uh, have this segment now where we're dedicating time to focus in on 2020 and also specifically how we've been pressed from all sides and pressured from all sides as we've gone through this year with different experiences and different things happening, whether locally or in our country or in the world. We've invited Candy DeVore, who's a family and life counselor from the Orlando area, to have a conversation with her about how we can pivot in regards to mental health and how to take better care of our minds and what happens inside of us. And so I had the privilege to sit down with her for seven conversations, one for each night, on how we can take better care of our minds during this season. So please watch this interview. Welcome to uh, Pivot Shifting Directions, Same Destination. My name is Ruben. in a little bit on mental health, what that is and what it looks like in 2020. But before we jump into that, we want to get to know you, Candy, just a little bit. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and uh, how God has led you uh, through this journey in life to where you are today? Sure. Whew, it's kind of a convoluted way to talk about pivoting, <laughs> yeah, going in the same direction. Um, <clears throat> So uh, my husband and I are blessed to have two adult daughters, and unfortunately they live in different directions. I have one in Baltimore and one in Los Angeles, so we don't get to see them as much as we would like to. And now with the pandemic, of mm. course, um, we're spending a lot of time on Zoom. We've, mm. we've discovered lots of games we can play and things that we can do to stay connected. I came here to Orlando uh, in an effort to support my parents who are aging. My father is 97, my mother is 94. They were living independently until about five years ago when I moved down. It took about three years for my husband to come down, join us, but he's here. Uh, he's also in mental health. He is a psychiatric nurse. So we uh, are enjoying our time here. I came down here because I was working as an editor at the Review and Herald Publishing Association mm -hmm. and they closed their doors. Mm -hmm. So I did have to take a major pivot mm -hmm. and discover what my new purpose was and uh, thankfully I'm very grateful, although at the time um, I was a little questioning, but I'm very grateful to be mm -hmm. where we are now doing mm -hmm. what we're doing and here with you. So I did not know that about you, Candy, that you lived in Maryland and I grew up in Maryland. So that's, that's oh, cool. <laughs> very cool. Um, so Candy, we're in 2020 and 2020 has uh, brought a lot of surprises and um, there has been a lot of changes happening all at once. Um, you know, there's no book, there's no experience that could have prepared us for what we are going through. So from your perspective, from your field, um, how have uh, you uh, seen and uh, experienced 2020 develop uh, in regards to mental health and uh, individuals, families um, at large? Well, it's definitely had an impact. And we know from the studies that have been done and the statistics show that suicide has gone up, mm -hmm. that domestic violence has gone up. Um, one of the things that surprised me at the very beginning, because as a in, within my mental health cohort, you know, we prepared ourselves for an onslaught. And actually, at the beginning of quarantine, um, people pulled in hmm. and pulled away, and were not reaching out for help. They hmm. were so, I think, in shell shock that they just um, didn't realize that they could reach out or that they needed to. We found that when schools opened back up again, that suddenly the need for counseling mm. has actually taken an uptick, at least for the people that I've spoken with. So I think people realized that this is a long-term thing where we thought it was going to be very short-term. We can hunker down for the short-term of it and move on, and um, that hasn't proven to be true. Um, lots of depression, lots mm. of anxiety. Um, anxiety has been probably the biggest topic of discussion, dealing with the stress and anxiety of loneliness, of isolation, of re-entry back into society. That has been very, very difficult for quite a few people. Knowing how to navigate that, 
knowing how to find that balance between feeling that you're doing what you need to do to protect yourself versus having friends that may have more rigid standards or may have more lax standards. You know, do we sit mm. across from each other six feet apart without a mask or not? Mm. These questions that are constantly in the forefoot, forefront that have brought anxiety and stress mm. where before it was unknown, as you mentioned. Right. So we're, we're uh, looking at mental health and we're talking about mental health within a um, community of faith. And there's many stereotypes in, in regards to uh, psychology or going to a counselor, <laughs> mentor, and all of that. And we can't unpack all of that right no. now. <laughs> um, but what would you say to someone that has experienced anxiety or stress or depression or um, any mental illness that they share that with somebody of faith and they said, well, you just need to pray about or you just need to uh, you know read the bible more uh, what could you say into a situation like that so i have a real i have a real passion for this because unfortunately when we say that to someone mm -hmm. that has an anxiety disorder or may have a compulsive disorder immediately where they go is i'm feeling this way therefore my relationship with god is mm -hmm. not right and so it takes them deeper into a now they're even more isolated because not only do they feel isolated from their church, but maybe even from God. Right. I shouldn't be feeling this way. It's a sin for me to feel this way. Hmm. In reality, we're humid. Humid, is it? Yes, but we are human. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and these are feelings and thoughts that we have that come and learning to control them, learning to think hmm. about them and to deal with them and manage them. Seeking professional help is daunting. But it's like anything else in life. When we are educated, then suddenly the fear that was attached to that thing is taken away. So if I'm educated to understand what anxiety is, what stress is, and how to manage it, then suddenly I have tools to deal with this, and I can move forward. And anxiety and stress definitely requires um, and, and is bettered by a relationship with God. But having anxiety and stress does not mean that our relationship with God is not intact. And that's a really important message. Yeah, and that's a powerful one. And I think that's one that we need to hear over and over again uh, to help us uh, better understand where we are and the steps that we can take in the right direction. And so as we're talking about pivoting, uh, coming from all sorts of different uh, 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 places and going different directions and trying to go a place that we will find balance or we will find health or we'll find purpose and value. Those are a lot of things that I'm saying, um, but we're trying to go, we're trying to be healthy. We're trying to be balanced. We want to have the strength to make it through this season. So uh, you mentioned one practical step of if I am going, if I feel overwhelmed or I feel anxious and I notice that there's something wrong to seek, to seek help. Mm -hmm. uh, could you mention, are there other practical things that we could do today, maybe even tonight uh, to, to, to start taking the steps in the right direction. So the staff kind of laugh at me here because I constantly bring them back to one technique and one tool. Mental health is like a toolbox and we we gather these things and put them in our toolbox and we pull them out when we need them to help us mm -hmm. deal with the stress and anxiety. Intentional breathing is the basic tool for me. That is the tool that I teach anyone, no matter what they come through my door, what their complaint mm -hmm. is. We learn about intentional breathing. Our brains can only think of one thing at a time. We have a tendency to think that we can multitask, but we cannot. And when we have this cacophony of things that are mm -hmm. yelling at us, do I wear a mask, don't I wear a mask, what are the COVID numbers, what's happening with racism, all of these things that are going on around us become so loud in our heads that we can't be still. And the Bible admonishes us to be still. And, and, and we know that God's voice is a still small voice, which means if we are not still, we cannot hear it. So taking the time to stop and breathe, and it's super simple and I'm gonna teach it real quick. You count one to 10. You breathe in on all the odd numbers, you breathe out on all the even numbers, okay? You breathe in through your nose, you breathe out like you have a straw in between your lips. What this does, when you, when you measure your breathing and you do it with the counting, it makes those other voices stop. You can only think about one thing, and if you're thinking about breathing and you're thinking about counting, then what happens is, is that you come to a place where you are still. And from that place, it's a reboot for your brain. From that place, then you can choose what you want to think about next. You can choose where you wanna go. You can choose rather to embrace an anxious thought to choose a scripture. Mm. 
You can choose rather than to feel stressed about something mm -hmm. or thinking about something that is, not, is a negative thought. You can mm -hmm. choose a thought of gratitude. So it's such an important foundational mm -hmm. tool that we can use to manage our anxiety and bring us to a place where we truly can be still. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Uh, I love that, and because uh, many times we feel that nothing, that everything's out of control, mm -hmm. um, that uh, everything that's coming our way, there's nothing that we can do about it. But you just mentioned a technique that will give us this sense that we will think about one thing, and hopefully, if we're choosing to allow God space during those moments, we will gain this sense of security and peace um, that comes from within. Absolutely, that will help us kind of reframe what's happening uh, around us. I couldn't have said it better myself. So thank you so much, Candy, uh, for this segment. And we look forward for uh, the segment that we'll have every single night on, on mental health and how God is wanting to us to come from these different directions, but to have that final destination with him. Thank you. Tonight with, we have with us Pastor Javier Diaz. Pastor Diaz is the conference field secretary for North Florida. And at the end of his presentation, we will have a live conversation with Pastor Diaz, and we'd love for you to be part of it. And so we encourage you first to text PIVOTFL to 77411. Again, that's PIVOTFL to 77411. Or you can leave a, a comment on the platform that you're using, whether it's Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, whatever platform you're using. But we'd love for you to be part of that conversation, send your question, comments, and, and even your prayer request. Let's now listen to how we can pivot our lives toward God. Hi everyone, and welcome to Pivot, Shifting Directions, Same Destination, a seven night, seven speaker event that we pray will be a blessing, will be helpful and hopeful to you and to all those that will be watching. Pray with me. Gracious God, I pray that your Holy Spirit lead and guide and speak to us this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1967, Martin Luther King Jr. gave a speech entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? It was given at the 11th Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Towards the end of his speech, Pastor King took over. Here's a few highlights of what he said. And if you will let me be a preacher, just a little bit, King said. One day, one night, a juror came to Jesus. Jesus didn't get boggled down on the kind of isolated approach of what you shouldn't do. Jesus didn't say, now Nicodemus, you must stop lying. He didn't say, Nicodemus, now you must not commit adultery. He didn't say, now Nicodemus, you must stop cheating if you are doing that. Nicodemus, you must stop drinking liquor. He said something altogether different because Jesus realized something basic. So instead of just getting boggled down on one thing, Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, your whole structure must be changed. Then Dr. King went on to say, what some may argue resonates even today. He says, what I'm saying today is that we must go from this convention and say, America, you must be born again. Dr. King and all those involved in the fight for equality at that time had seen and been through a whole lot to say the least. And though much had changed in the 10 years leading up to this particular speech Dr. King was giving, he was also clear and spoke of the continued need the call for America to, well, pivot, to change directions to the point that he calls on America as Jesus called upon Nicodemus on that secret secluded encounter, you must be born again. So let's explore this aspect of being born again through the incredible story and narrative where it's found in John chapter 3. We begin in verse 1. It says, 
Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. And then Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again or born from above. Dr. King was correct in that Jesus essentially gets to the point with Nicodemus. He doesn't go with the flow of the conversation that Nicodemus seemed to want to take. Jesus likely looking directly into Nicodemus' eyes with a heart of love and patience tells Nicodemus, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again or born from above. There's an interesting point here as we study and break down this passage, and it's that those repeated words translated verily, verily, or truly, truly, is actually the well-known, if not universally known word, amen, in the original Greek. It's often used to affirm a statement at the end, such as if I were to say, Jesus is love, and you would say, amen, meaning that you affirm that statement. Interesting, one Bible commentary points out the following. Of all New Testament writers, only John doubles the word, amen, amen. He does so altogether 25 times in each instance, quoting Jesus. You see, John, the writer of this passage, is clearly seeking to strongly emphasize what Jesus is saying. So Jesus begins his response to Nicodemus with an emphatic, amen, amen, to affirm with strength to Nicodemus and everyone who would hear and read this story, this encounter, that in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again, born from above. Uh, Nicodemus was an influential, well-to-do religious elite, versed in tradition in the Old Testament scriptures. And though many historians and scholars believe Nicodemus had already been present, seeing and hearing the works of Jesus, he now seems to be interested in knowing more personally what Jesus had to say. So now let's listen to Nicodemus' response to Jesus' famous words, you must be born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And according to John, Jesus answers Nicodemus once again with that double affirmation, amen, amen. Truly, truly, I tell you, Jesus says, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And then we read Nicodemus ask the question, how can this be? So how can this be? How are we born again or born from above? How did you believe it happened for you? And some may be saying, well, I was born again 5, 10, 15, 20 plus years ago, and I believe you. But the question is not when, but how? And so then some may answer and well and say, I was invited to an evangelistic meeting through a flyer in the mail, a, a personal invitation, or I was invited to a church worship gathering and accepted Jesus. Whatever may be the case for you, I don't doubt your story. I praise God for it. But I also believe that Jesus' response to Nicodemus gives us a deeper how than what some of us may have pondered. Listen closely to Jesus' response as this interview between Nicodemus 
and Jesus seems to come to an end. Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher? And do you not understand these things? In other words, Nicodemus, you don't understand the how? Jesus continues, and we read once again the emphasis coming from John the writer. Truly, truly, amen, amen, I tell you. We speak of what we know, Jesus said, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in Him. So, how can it be? It's a valid question. How can someone be born again? Jesus seems to be saying to Nicodemus and to you and to me today, the essence of being born again has a mystery to it. For it is the work of God and by God from start to finish. I'm going to say that again. It is the work of God and by God from start to to finish. The one thing humanity does is respond. We choose how we respond to the prompting of God in our lives. It also seems Jesus is saying God is always working in some way, shape, or form in your life and in mine. We may or may not always notice, yet it was Nicodemus' response to the Holy Spirit touching his heart that even brought him to meet Jesus alone at night, one-on-one. -on -one. It is the Holy Spirit that has brought you to, to click and listen this evening. God is working at this very moment. How will you respond to what Jesus is saying to you? One of my favorite writers says some profound words speaking on how we are born Again, she says this, By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart. Beautiful. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. These may be received through meditating upon Him, through reading the scriptures, or through hearing the word from the living preacher. Suddenly, as the Spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. By many, this is called sudden conversion, but it is the result of long wooing by the Spirit of God, a patient, protracted process. I love that last line, a patient, protracted process. Friends, God has been and is currently and will continue through different means be wooing you and I to pivot, to shift directions towards the same destination. That destination is spending eternity face to face with Jesus. Right now, I believe if our eyes could see what we cannot see, we would see the Holy Spirit working in your life wanting you to respond as God is speaking to you at this very moment. It is a constant loving wooing by God. This patient, protracted process is God's specialty. Listen to what Peter, one of John's friends and fellow disciples of Jesus says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, perhaps through everything you and I have encountered in this crazy 2020 year, and honestly, whatever may come in 2021, God's speaking to us. He's wooing us, calling us to pivot, shift our direction fully toward Jesus. The story of Nicodemus is your story. It's my story. 
and it's John, the writer of this gospel story. You see, we are called to be born again, yet the next and parallel step in the journey of being born again is to grow in Christ, to grow in our belief and our walk with Jesus. Follow me here. You see, many scholars believe that John was the youngest of the disciples and probably began following Jesus around the age of 17. But by the time he writes this gospel, where we read this encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus, though debated, John is probably in his 70s or early 80s, give or take. He had definitely grown from being one of the sons of thunder, as he and his brother were known, to pivoting and becoming more and more like Jesus. John had shifted and he had seen Christianity and society shift as well. Not always for the better, for he was experiencing persecution himself. Can you picture it? Can you picture this beloved disciple of Jesus, now most likely in his latter years of life, thinking back this Holy Spirit-led encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus and those powerful words that he quotes, you must be born again. With that in mind, we continue studying John's narrative in chapter 3. And some scholars and Bible students believe that most likely there seems to be a shift, a pivot by John from Jesus speaking with Nicodemus to the author of the gospel himself, John, addressing the reader. And many believe that the shift might have taken place between verses 15 and 16. But, but let's read again verses 14 and 15 for context. Jesus' words to Nicodemus right before John pivots, speaking directly to the reader. This is what Jesus says in verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So according to John, Jesus illustrates the foundation of this born again experience to Nicodemus by mentioning the well-known historical experience in the life of the Israelites, that is of Moses lifting up the snake in the wilderness. That is an experience that Nicodemus would have absolutely been acquainted with. Jesus is essentially telling Nicodemus, it is only through my sacrifice on the cross that anyone and everyone can be born again. But then, as I mentioned, most probably John shifts and writes directly to the reader, seeming to emphasize again what he just quoted Jesus telling Nicodemus. Ultimately, John ends up pinning what would become the most well-known and most beloved text by many in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Can you picture John writing these words? It's hard to miss the fact that within Nicodemus' need to be born again, John's essentially emphasizing the need to believe in Jesus. Now, don't miss this. I want us to, to focus on that word believe just a bit. It's so important to John and how John uses the word believe in his gospel. Remember, he's, he's writing as a grown and growing disciple. The word believe for John is clearly an important word, used very intentionally and purposefully in his book. John tells us the why towards the end of his book by stating why he wrote the gospel. Listen carefully. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you, you and I, may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. In other words, the reason He wrote this gospel is pretty clear. 
It was so that you and I may believe or continue to believe. So that's the why. But now we briefly turn to the how John uses the word believe. And for the how of John's use of the word believe, listen to what New Testament scholar Dr. John Pauline from Loma Linda University School of Religion says. He states, It is a most intriguing point that faith is always a verb in the Gospel of John, which is translated believe. Faith as a verb is not static. It is, a, it is not a one-time thing. It is ongoing and continuous and action-oriented. As a verb, faith always has an object. Faith must be placed in something or in someone. In the Gospel of John, Believing is directed primarily to Jesus, the one who came down and was uplifted on the cross. Oh, friends, let's bring this all together. It seems through the encounter of Nicodemus and Jesus, through John's shift and writing the all-time well-known John 3.16, along with John's use of the word believe, God's Spirit, which is working right now, as we mentioned, is saying to you and to me, you must be born again. By believing in Jesus who was lifted up on the cross for you and for me. And this belief in Jesus is active and ongoing. It leads to a patient, protracted transformation in us. Going even further, John is the only Bible writer that even mentions Nicodemus, and he does so three times, interestingly enough. Perhaps to show Nicodemus's active, ongoing growth in his belief in Jesus. The three times are number one, of course, here, John chapter 3, the private conversation between, uh, between him and Jesus. The second time, interestingly enough, is John chapter 7. Nicodemus defends Jesus before the Sanhedrin council by reminding them that the law requires, listen carefully, a person be heard before judging them. Listen to what John writes of this encounter. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him? to find out what he has been doing. Now think about that just for a moment. Nicodemus goes from hearing Jesus in private to essentially defending Jesus in public or at least questioning the other leaders regarding the law that they should listen to Jesus. It seems Nicodemus was hoping that his fellow councilmen would listen to Jesus as he did, believe and be transformed. But lastly, the last time we hear John mention Nicodemus, I would say is fascinating as well. John mentions Nicodemus again, but this time not meeting Jesus in private, not defending Jesus among the religious leaders, but recovering Jesus' body that had been lifted up and crucified just as Jesus had told him at this point almost three years before. And just as the famous text John 3.16 states, listen to what John says. He, that's Joseph of Arimathea, was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds worth. That's a lot. Friends, it seems John in this gospel may be showing the greater, deeper picture of being born again. That it's not simply about some time and place that one accepts Jesus. It's essentially about believing in Jesus and becoming an ongoing, growing disciple of Jesus. John in his book shows us the power of transformation even in a man like Nicodemus that Jesus can have. He goes from a God-led, secret solo meeting to a fully disclosed disciple of Jesus. Listen again to what one of my favorite writers says regarding Nicodemus's actions bearing the body of Jesus. She says, The very event 
that destroyed the hopes of the disciples, the crucifixion, convinced Joseph and Nicodemus of the divinity of Jesus, their fears were overcome by the courage of a firm and unwavering faith or belief. Nicodemus responded to God's spirit that always is working and pivoted, becoming a disciple of Jesus. Friends, today, Jesus is saying to you and to me, you must be born again and grow in faith as his disciple. Pastor Tara Van Cross says in her recently released book that I highly recommend entitled Deep Calling on Being and Growing Disciples, she says, listen carefully, a biblical theology of the call to discipleship recognizes that individuals become disciples from the first moment they accept Jesus' invitation to follow. Disciples are declared clean by Jesus, even as they are being made clean. This is in direct contrast with the idea of some that the individual has to get things together to be useful to God. We say yes in response to the love and grace of God who always makes the first move towards us. As we journey with God, we are transformed. I love that last line as well. As we journey with God, there's implied that patient, protracted process. Today, right now, the Spirit of God is working in your life, my friend, wanting you to pivot. Pivot from unbelief to believing by responding and saying yes to Jesus. Pivot from feeling unworthy to believing God says, you are worthy no matter what you've done. Pivot from anxiety, anger, and restlessness to trust, reconciliation, and peace through God's grace. Pivot from thinking that you somehow got to get yourself right to knowing that God has made you right and our growth is a patient, protracted, lifetime process through God's grace. And you, church member that may be watching, perhaps longtime Seventh-day Adventist Christian, hear me in the name of Jesus. As Nicodemus, we are well-versed, full of knowledge, yet are we being transformed into His likeness. Today, He's calling you and me to pivot to look at Jesus and grow in grace. Listen to what my friend and colleague, Dr. Kidder in his book, The Big Four says, the greatest need of the church today is not more programs or techniques or books or seminars. It is to be filled, guided, moved and controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so it brings us full circle to Jesus' words to Nicodemus. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus is calling you to respond to His call, as did Nicodemus, as did John himself. Believe and by His grace become a growing disciple of Jesus. So why pivot? Because the Spirit of God is saying, to us. See Jesus lifted up on the cross for you and for me, saying, I love you. Realize His constant Spirit-filled wooing in your life, in my life. He's working right now, and He's saying to America and beyond, to whoever will believe, you must be born again. Thank you, Pastor Javier, for that pivotal presentation. And joining us in this conversation is Pastor Sebastian Lopez from the Palm Coast Church. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here every evening with uh, Jonathan as we'll be engaging deeper in these conversations. And we also want all of you to join us in this conversation. So again, we encourage you to text PIVOTFL to 77411. Again, that's PIVOTFL to 77411. Very good. So, 
Javier, thank you so much for this amazing conversation on the first night of Pivot, talking about being born again, of, of being a disciple of growth. And, and so what we're curious about as, as uh, just here dialoguing with you, do you mind sharing a little bit about your own Pivot story? You know, we all have this come to Jesus moment where we really, you know, take root into growing. Would you mind sharing your pivotal come to Jesus moment with us? Well, absolutely. Well, good evening to everybody. It's great to see you all. Great to see you pastors and those that are watching and those that will be watching. Um, it's a really a blessing to be able to start off this uh, seven nights, seven speaker series, pivot, shifting direction, same destination. And uh, what a great question, right? We just, I just spoke about that, uh, being born again. And I want to tell you, this is such a profound um, essence uh, topic uh, story for me personally, um, I would say over 20 years ago, uh, give or take, uh, I truly, through the circumstances of my life at that time, experienced a, a, a born again experience, or at least that's what I say, that's my journey. Uh, I grew up in a, a wonderful Christian home. Um, I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian home. Um, I, I had a lot of information, a lot of the do's and don'ts, and, um, and it was great. But at the same time, in my journey, in my experience, I, I really hadn't experienced that deep connection with Jesus. And so as I got older, um, in my early 20s, um, I'm 22 now, by the way. So. Uh, uh, but really in my early 20s, um, again, say, yeah, right. my, my circumstances at, at that time, the Holy Spirit really touched my life. And I just felt like Jesus was saying, I want to do something in your life. I want you to pivot from the life that you're living to the life that I want you to live. And at that time, it wasn't about being a pastor or a preacher or a teacher or anything of that. It was just simply shifting directions and, and, and following Jesus. And I realized that it was the beginning of a journey uh, that, that would be a lifetime. But um, again, it's something really personal to my life because I, I, I always look back to those moments when the Holy Spirit uh, was wooing me in different ways. And, and I finally responded and said, yes, you know, Jesus, as, as here I am, at this very moment, take me and make me yours. And, and I just invite everybody uh, to, to respond to the Holy Spirit as well. And, and Pastor Javier, you said that that was the beginning of your journey, right? I mean, not, not everything didn't change at that moment, but no. what, what did change? Yeah, good question. What did change? Uh, you know, it, 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 it changed, uh, all pun intended, as I pivoted, what changed was my direction. I began moving in, in that direction of Jesus. Uh, certainly, if, if anybody would have known me 20 plus years ago, I was a completely different person, I would say. And at that moment or during that, those time, that time of my life, I shifted. And I just began to want to respond more to what the Spirit of God was leading me to. In simple things, uh, reading the Bible, spending time in prayer, um, actually going to church and really wanting to hear what the, what the preacher had to say. And so those were some of the practical aspects of my life at that time. And again, it was a journey. It, it, it's, it's still a journey. I'm just praising God that I'm on that journey. Yeah, so, so there was a beginning, but then there's a growth process that, that continued to take place yeah. after that. That's still taking place right now. Is that fair right. to say? Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. That's beautiful. I think, you know, Jonathan and I could spend maybe hours in the same way as, you, you know, talking about your own story, how we all have a, a beginning. Can you repeat that, though, that, that phrase you said, right, where it's, it's not just that you get it to there to be where, you know, the, this perfect place at one time. It's a progressive. You, you said a phrase there. I don't know if you can mention that. With the quote that I mentioned in the, in the sermon, in the teaching, but um, I really love that last phrase, a patient, protracted process. And that is for all of us. I love that line and I've memorized it. I, I always tell myself, God is patient with me. Praise the Lord. Um, he's a patient, protracted process. I am in a process. So I, 
I am saved by the blood of the Lamb, and God is growing me through His grace as I respond to the Holy Spirit in my life. And uh, I praise God once again. I, I don't, I have no shame in repeating this. It is a patient, protracted process. Yeah, and, and as you were sharing uh, the story of Nicodemus, um, I think you mentioned something, that there was something important, a pivotal verse. I think you mentioned verse 15 of John chapter 3, maybe pivoting to verse 16. Can, can you expound a little bit more on that one? Because that intrigued me. Sure, sure. Um, well, I, scholars defer here. Um, I tend to lean on this side. But many believe that as John was um, in his you know, 70s or 80s and he's remembering the story of Nicodemus and Jesus and the encounter, he most likely, most likely, tends to pivot, tends to shift in verse 15, where, where he says, uh, in verse 14 and 15, he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. And it seems that that's where the conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus finishes. And I'm using my imagination here, but I believe that then at that moment, John just begins to write to his listeners, to those that would read the gospel. Little, little did he know one way or another that John 3.16, as we know it today, would be one of the most beloved verses in the history of humanity, arguably, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it seems to me that John is re-emphasizing what Nicodemus and Jesus were, you know, conversing, and John just continues to expand on that theme that all who believe may not perish, but have eternal life. And so I, I just love that. And again, I'm using my sanctified imagination, if I could, uh, that, that this elderly, grown and growing disciple, even at that age, is, is contemplating, is thinking of the love of Jesus and what Jesus has done. And he, and once again, for God so loved the world that whoever will believe will have everlasting life. And so it, it's just a beautiful shift there in a verse that, of course, uh, many, if not all of us, have heard and know of. Wow. So, so you're saying that verse 15 were the words of Jesus, but then uh, 16 are the words of John, the Apostle John. Is that right? That's correct. That's, that's what many uh, Bible students and scholars believe. Again, there's some dispute on that, but uh, I tend to lean on that side. So. Wow, that's, that's pretty powerful to think about that. But then something else that I wonder about is how did John even know about this conversation? I mean, was, was John there? I mean, how, how, did that, how did he know those exact words that, that yeah, were said? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, Many believe, uh, I tend to believe, I should say, I'll say it this way, I tend to lean on the side, um, and, and, and some Bible commentators also agree, that it was Nicodemus eventually who told uh, his story to John. Um, it's interesting that uh, Nicodemus isn't mentioned in any of the, other, uh, of the other Gospels, and John, as I mentioned in my talk, mentions him three times. And it, it seems to me, at least in part, perhaps, that, that John is emphasizing the essence of believe through the story of Nicodemus, right? So Nicodemus, he begins to grow in his belief in Jesus. It's an active belief. He goes from meeting Jesus in secret to defending him in John chapter 7, and then to openly taking the body of Jesus um, and basically becoming an advocate for Jesus. Um, and for the gospel and the witness of Jesus afterwards as well. So we see a progression, a growth in Nicodemus. And what an example for you and for me, uh, as I was studying this, uh, uh, a story that many of us know, but as I was studying it even further in my own life, I, I was saying, what a, what a beautiful picture of a person that knew a lot about the Bible in his day, but had not encountered Jesus. And when he encountered Jesus and his love and began to understand why Jesus died and his resurrection and that everything was going to change, 
he became a force for the gospel and the witness of Jesus in that then known world. And it's just an inspiration to me as well. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Javier. I appreciate that. We have a couple comments coming in. Just want to take note of them. You know, uh, someone mentioned, I can definitely say that about myself, right? This patient, protracted process, yeah. that growing and surrendering more as I grow older. And someone else mentioned, I feel like the path of Nicodemus is kind of the same path of most Christians born in a church. They know mm. all the rules and regulations, but most of us are just going with the flow and missing the real transformation. So, Javier, in light of these 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 conversation, these, these comments here, we you know we've been talking about Nicodemus becoming a, a disciple, right, and, and that, that process that it took between, you know, really meeting Jesus and then later on in his life finally being vocal and, and strong and, and saying, hey, I'm a, I'm a follower and believer of Jesus. What would you say, right, in our modern context of 2020, our current reality, what does a disciple in 2020 look like? Yeah, I know it's a loaded question, but what, what do you yeah. think? <laughs> in that process that we're on, right, what does a 2020 disciple look like for us today? Yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a great question, and it is a loaded question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much time we have left, uh, but that's a, that's a whole other sermon, uh, perhaps a whole other series. But I'll say this. Uh, a disciple of Jesus in, in principle looks the same today than that it would back then. A disciple of Jesus is, is somebody who has responded to the wooing of the Holy Spirit in our lives and has pivoted, has shifted directions, and now is moving in the, in the direction of Jesus. And it is a growth, a journey. We say yes, as uh, Pastor Tara Van Cross, the uh, you know, quote from her book, Deep Calling, we say yes. And then we move forward as Jesus guides us. And in, in my life, I just give you a, a little story. In my life, the way that that worked in, in practicality is that I say that I used to hate to read. I mean, I hated to read anything. I, the only thing I read was the sports section, right? Uh, but when I encountered Jesus, the Holy Spirit just, just began to lead me to want to read the Bible. And interestingly enough, in, uh, during that time of my life, during that conversion experience, a few months before everything changed for me, interestingly enough, somebody had given me a Bible. And I have that Bible still today. I have a lot of Bibles in my library now. And I can lose or do away with any Bible except that one because it has sentimental value. Um, that Bible, I began, I, I, I grabbed it, I had just, uh, I said thank you to the person who gave it to me, and I just put it away somewhere, and, and when I went through that conversion experience, the first, the first direction that I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to, and I remember, I had grown, I was raised in the church, but the first direction was to grab that Bible and begin to read it and experience the love of Jesus for myself. Now, let me tell you again, I didn't understand a lot of what I was reading. But the Holy Spirit was just telling me, you begin to read and I will teach you. And, and so that's what I would say uh, as an illustration is a disciple of Jesus in principle looks the same all the time, is one who has shifted directions in the way of Jesus and begins to respond as the Holy Spirit is telling them whatever it's telling him or her, uh, whatever the family, if it's a family that they're all shifting directions, uh, they begin to have moments where they, they turn off Netflix and they said, let's have worship together. And, 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 and you see the shift there. And family and friends, I just wanna tell you from my own journey, um, again, I'm, I'm still on, we're all still on this, you know, this journey. I, I, I haven't arrived but my life has never been the same. And even, even today, you know, these last seven or eight months since the pandemic hit, um, I'm going to be transparent here. The, uh, the Holy Spirit, or I should say not transparent, I said I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable here. Uh, the Holy Spirit has been, been working in my life, even deepening my desire for, for prayer, for Bible study. I've now been a pastor for 15 plus, you know, years. And 
I've preached and I've taught, but I still sense a deeper essence of wanting to draw closer to Jesus. And as I've been doing that, I'm just opening myself up to you. I'm being real. I've noticed the Holy Spirit telling me just little things that he, 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 he wants me to do. Um, make a phone call to somebody, something so simple of, of perhaps people, my family or friends that I haven't spoken to in a while. Call them. Little things like that that I just sensed that before when I was allowing all the hustle and bustle and the noise around me to overcome me, I have began to sit still and know that he is God. And in this crazy world that we are living in in 2020, I, I, I want to encourage you all to, to listen to the wooing of the Holy Spirit, because even as I'm speaking right now, I believe that the Holy Spirit is working in, in your life and in my life. And so it, it was a loaded question. Forgive me for going a little bit longer. I wish I could say more, but I'll, I'll stop there. But I think that's part of my answer for what does a, a disciple look like today. And, and one thing, one more thing I would say that a disciple of Jesus today, again, it, it looks the same in principle, moving in the direction of Jesus, and simply is showing the love of Jesus uh, uh, at, at all times. Even in this whole election season and the divisions that we have politically and everything else, we're always called to follow Jesus and to love even the ones that are unlovable because that is only done by the grace of Christ. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Javier. You know, in that last question, we have run out of time, but that last, that last answer that you gave was so good. And there's so much in there that I'd like to unpack. I mean, you're reading scripture. I mean, you're feeling uh, the Holy Spirit leading you to read scripture. You don't understand everything you're reading, but you're following and obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit leading in that prompting. That's, that's so good. But we do have to end it now. But uh, one of the ta my takeaways from your presentation is when you said that it is the work of God and by God from start to finish. Uh, Pastor Javier, can you give us the final appeal for tonight? Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Um, I appreciate the conversation, and thank you all for watching and for tuning in. And as we conclude this evening, I just want to appeal to you. I really want to give just two appeals. Perhaps somebody is watching or will watch this that has not surrendered their life to Jesus, that is still struggling to fully say, I want to give my life to Jesus. And I want to appeal to you in the name of Jesus. Jesus loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall believe may not perish but have eternal life. And if you will go to floridaconference.com slash my decision, we are appealing. We are, we are asking you to go and click there. And perhaps the Holy Spirit is calling you today to be born again. Perhaps you've, you've moved, you've been wooed away from the opposite direction of following Jesus. And you want to be reborn once again. And I want to just encourage you to go there and make that decision. Perhaps you want to be baptized. Perhaps you want to talk to somebody about your faith journey. And so I want to pray for you. I believe that like we are living in a time like never before, a time of revival, a time where the Holy Spirit is really asking us to surrender our life, our soul, every being of our lives. Because honestly, I believe Jesus is coming soon. But in the midst of our waiting, he is calling us to live out our faith. And so my second appeal is to those who firmly believe in Jesus, to those uh, that are followers of Jesus. I'm appealing to you and I'm appealing to myself. May we fully surrender even deeper to our Lord and Savior Jesus that we may grow as disciples, just as Nicodemus was grew in his knowledge and love of Jesus, just as the apostle John went from being a sons of thunder, right, to being the beloved of Jesus. They grew in their knowledge and in their love of Jesus. It is infinite for us to continue to grow as followers of Jesus. And when the Holy Spirit comes down, it'll shake a room and he wants to use you and he wants to use me. So if you will go to floridaconference.com slash my decision and, and perhaps click on 
on the prayer section and write out, I want to follow Jesus even deeper. I want to pivot and shift directions in the direction of Jesus. And so I want to pray for you tonight. Once again, I want to pray for those that perhaps have not accepted Jesus or, or want to recommit their life to Jesus and be born again. And secondly, I want to pray for those who truly just want to say today, oh Lord, I want to pivot fully in your direction. I want to be used by the Holy Spirit. I want to be a witness to you as we all are anyways and tell people of the love of Jesus, of the gospel that changes everything. Pray with me. Gracious and heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I want to thank you for the story of Nicodemus and that encounter that you had with him. I yearn for that day where, where I will be able to talk with Nicodemus, to talk with John, but Lord, obviously to see you face to face. Lord, thank you for dying for us. That sacrifice, Lord, that you surrendered your life, that we may have life. I want to pray for those right now who are making a decision for you. There's somebody watching tonight. There's somebody that will perhaps watch later and hear this. Lord, your spirit is a patient, protracted process in their life. And maybe, just maybe, if they're listening, it is because you have called them to listen to this appeal and surrender their lives and be born again. And I also, Lord, now want to pray for those of us that we call ourselves believers. We love you. But nonetheless, you are calling us to an even deeper experience with you. A revival of this led by the spirit of the living God that we will respond to you and we will move forward as witnesses, powerful witnesses in this crazy world that we live in today. We will show people by the being your hands and feet of Jesus, your love, your passion. We will speak up and speak out against all oppression. We will speak up and speak out of your love, Lord, and the transforming power as you lead and guide through your spirit. And so I pray for each person that will make that decision tonight. Thank you, O oh God, for you are the God that has not only listened to this prayer and all those that are making this decision, that you have answered them because you are with them right now. For you are the God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believes shall not perish, but have everlasting life and pivot towards you. In your name we pray. Amen. We want to thank uh, Javier for the message and uh, both the gentlemen behind me for the interview tonight and being uh, able to talk a little bit about this topic on pivoting and beginning this process after we go through these topics of what God is inviting us to do every single night. And so as I was going through my phone, I'm able to connect and see those that have sent a message to 7741-PIVOT-FL. And I'm really wanting to give away, I have one gift card that I want to give away. Uh, Kristen Robinson and Stella Harris already have won a prize tonight, but I want to give away the third one, okay? So whether you're in the house here tonight or you're watching online, I want to give away this gift card or else I'll take it home with me, okay? I don't want to take it home. I want to give it to you. Next person to text, Floor, uh, F Pivot FL, Pivot FL to 77411 will we'll get that $25 gift card tonight. So go ahead and text right now that number. You might be our winner for tonight. So tonight we started to pivot and tomorrow we continue to pivot. Tomorrow's topic is how we can, how, how learning who we are, our identity, we gain purpose and we gain direction. So you can't miss tomorrow night, whether you're watching online uh, or whether you're in the building, make sure you tune in to tomorrow's topic as we continue to shift direction, same destination.